Welcome to Front Lines. We'll take a moment here right at the start to allow people to do their shares and cross posts and we'll get started. Welcome to our viewers from across the United States and Canada, throughout the Middle East, uh, Australia, as well as Europe, and of course, from Armenia and Artsakh. Uh, we are at a very uh, peculiar and indeed surreal time in Armenian history, and we're living those moments. Uh, we have been living those moments since the beginning of the war, September 7, 2020. And as the days, weeks, and months progress, the, the dire nature of the outcome only becomes more apparent. Uh, without an extended introduction so that we can get into the matters involving the border issues, Sunik and related issues uh, with our guest today, I'll pass it on to Garo to make a brief introduction so we can jump right into the issues today. Thank you, Karnik. Good morning, uh, fellow Armenians in Armenia and Artsakh, and good day. Uh, around the globe. Our guest is a frequent guest, unfortunately a frequent guest because there's frequently things that have to be discussed with none other than the human rights defender of the Republic of Armenia, our friend and yours, Ombudsman Arman Tatoyan. Arman Pariegas is Cyrilic. Arman Jan. Karnik, go for it. Yeah. Um, if we can, uh, Armanjan, if we can begin right away with the, your last visit to the, to the border regions and the issue regarding uh, Sevlij and the, uh, the, the issues that are uh, at, on the table right now regarding the incursion of Azerbaijani forces inside three, three and a half kilo, uh, kilometers of the Armenian border. Uh, and the issues that you've observed and your mission has, uh, has observed and, uh, and the most recent events, if you can uh, bring our guests up to speed. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to the front lines. Karl and John, Karl and John, I'm very glad to see you. And uh, thank you for choosing this very important topic related to the protection of uh, the rights of our border residents uh, in Sunik and Gerard Kornik and of course, issues related to the limitation of and, and the process related to the borders of Armenia. As you know, and as uh, all, all our compatriots know, on May 12th and May 13th, Azerbaijani military personnel uh, evoking a blatant, blatantly fake map have breached the territorial integrity of Armenia and made an illegal incursion inside the borders of Armenia, specifically towards the region of, as Karnik said, Sevlich or Black Lake, and subsequently towards the civilian communities. The same goes for the Gerhard Kornik province. And here we have also, a, again, um, a referral by, by Azerbaijani armed forces to illegal, uh, some um, maps and fake maps and again, illegal incursion inside the territory of Armenia towards the civilian communities, which is uh, very important. Right after this news and after this, uh, I would say, very illegal criminal uh, action of Azerbaijani military servicemen, we started fact-finding mission and conducted fact-finding activities. And uh, I would just very quickly turn to the results of the fact-finding activities, especially related to um, to their to the uh, violation and breaches of the border residents' rights. So, according to our fact-finding mission, Azerbaijani armed uh, servicemen, which is by the way uh, the same both for Gerhard Kunik and Sunik, threatened when they appeared in the in the territory of Armenia. They threatened with guns shepherds who are border residents of Armenia with weapons while illegally being present in the sovereign territory of Armenia. 
and uh, I would now give you some details. Specifically, in the region falling between the Black Lake or Sevillage and Verishen village of Goris community in Sunik province, Azerbaijani armed servicemen approached the shepherd of the village who was gazing the animals on the dawn of May 12th, threatened him and with a show of weapons demanded that he leaves the barn and the pasture. And uh, our fact-finding activity the, of the human rights defender demonstrated that the barn of the shepherd of the village very shame, is located in the area of the pasture permanently used by the resident of, residents of, by the way, another village, Akner village. There are two villages above, uh, the, above this uh, region and up to the uh, Black, sea, Black Lake, sorry, and a number of the other uh, villages in the area falling between Black Lake and very shame civilian community. The Black Lake is located in the, of course, apparently in the territory of Armenia. In the area of the barns in the pastures of Verin Shorja village, this is already a Vartenis community of Gerar Kunik province, around 10 Azerbaijani armed servicemen approached the shepherd of the Verin Shorja village on May 12th and threatened him with a show of weapons, speaking to him also in the Armenian language, by the way. On the wow. same day, when six shepherds from Vartenis and Ayrk, uh, from Vartenis community, which is basically the city, but uh, considered the community uniting also several villages. So the Vartenis community and Ayrk village grazed their large and small cattle around the water basin near the same pasture located in the territory of Armenia. And dozens of, several dozens of Azerbaijani armed servicemen approached them threatened again them with a show of weapons and gave them again several minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes to leave. Otherwise they threatened to take them as captives even or to kill. Similarly on May 13, about 50 Azerbaijani servicemen, this is already the next day, servicemen threatened the shepherd of Beni Shorja village with a show of weapons, again with the same, with the same illegal criminal demand. And uh, the, the, the uh, specific or the peculiarity with Vart, with Gevarkonik province is that here we have several parts, let's say, where Azerbaijani soldiers uh, have, we, we can observe their illegal incursion inside the territory of Armenia. So this is the part related to the, uh, more to the very Shorja uh, village, to the pastures of very Shorja village. And there is another, the, the, another part related to the, which is next to the Kut village, right in the direct vicinity of the Kut village. So on May 12th, again, the shepherd, uh, they approached the shepherd from Kut village. This is already the Gera Massage community, uh, who went by the, the shepherd went to the barn in his, in his pasture, located adjacent to the village and discovered around 50, as he could observe, and as he told us, about 50 Azerbaijani armed servicemen. Again, uh, the same, the same. They gave him several couple of minutes and they said that this is our territory. Right now you have to live and this is the demand. Uh, this was the demand from their side. So during the visit, it became our visit. It became very apparent that the pastures are located, uh, allocated to the people on the basis of rent by the legal documents of local authorities. By the way, I have to say that all these pastures are belong to people at least almost all of them belong to people based on legal documentation. This is right that they rented them and they rent them from communities. Therefore, the issue is related also to the illegal deprivation of, of their uh, legally obtained rights. And according to the shepherds, they no longer have access to the pastures. And there are certain several other shepherds already who left already these this pastures. And the issue is that the, the, the fact that the Azerbaijani armed servicemen has physically are physically present in the pastures and the, that, that legally belong to the people and, uh, and in some cases it is impossible to use the pastures since they fall under Azerbaijani line of fire or the target because there is certain territory we posted even a special photo illustrating presence of Azerbaijani, the, Azer, the exact location of Azerbaijani military and the location of uh, cattle barn and if they, if, if pasture, if shepherds approach uh, or try to approach their barns, then Azerbaijani military or their servicemen open fire. Uh, they may open fire in the air or they may open fire uh, towards the barn, but you know, it does not matter that this is the existence 
the, the, the problem is that we have this illegal actions of Azerbaijani military. And that at the same um, time, Shepard, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, forgive the interruption. Um, Arman, look, uh, I know your time is limited. I, 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 I want you to finish your thought, but I, I have three areas I want to take you. Uh, and consider this, you know, we keep hearing about delimitation, demarcation, Carnegie will probably, you know, uh, put the question better, uh, but you, uh, we hear from you repeatedly, security zone, security zone, security zone, and how the process of delimitation and demarcation will take years, sometimes decades, um, in as much as, you know, there is uh, much to say and, and many who have said many things about the acting government, if you will. Um, I know you're not into the political aspect of it, but politics uh, and war always, uh, always affect human rights. So from the human rights perspective, with this delimitation, demarcation, security zone that you keep talking about, and this so-called new document that's not signed, may be signed, may not be signed, um, I know uh, your efforts and your team's efforts. I know you guys went to the hospital on May 28th or 21st, the fist fights that lasted about 30 minutes between soldiers on both sides who had uh, automatic machine guns, but somehow, you know, people are trying to avoid firing the first shot. But, you know, I can't imagine people living in these villages. Uh, I can imagine, you can imagine it because you went there. Uh, so there's, there's the bulk subject matter that I want us to cover. Karnik, forgive the interruption and uh, and forgive the interruption as well, Arman, yourself as well. Go ahead. Yes, well, this is this is a very important uh, question. The, the most the most important one nowadays related to the protection of rights of our border residents. Uh, it's self-delimitation, only delimitation, without creating a security zone according to the concept that we are now developing where we are finalizing and we will publish it very soon. We are now waiting for some specific information from communities, from bordering communities. But I'm more than confident that only demarcation, demarcation or the end delimitation, sorry, this will entail and will bring new violations, new breaches of rights of our border residents. This process, is very dangerous in terms of it is it contains uh, dangers in terms of new tensions, and I'm sure that it will not contribute to the peace and security in the region. The new demarcation the, and delimitation and demarcation. Uh, Kaujan, you know, there are, according to international standards, certain rules, specific rules exist and are have been adopted by OSCE by United Nations, by other international organizations that concern delimitation and demarcation. And why I'm, my interest here is very, is very, is based on international standards because it's self-delimitation, proper delimitation is a guarantee uh, for human rights. But when considering the processes of delimitation and demarcation of our borders, mm -hmm. we have also to consider certain very important factors that do exist and are very specific for our region. And if you allow, I will just very quickly try to list them. First of all, we have to take into, and by the way, this, all of them are, are mandatory and uh, all, of, all of these factors, and we cannot ignore any of them. And uh, the first thing is that Azerbaijani, highest authorities of Azerbaijani, political authorities, they not only did not stop but also deepened after the war and continuing, and they continue deepening the policy of armenophobia and uh, even the policy of animosity amounting to fascism. And I have, my words are based on evidence. These are not just, you know, assessments or evaluations uh, without grounds, but they are or groundless assessments. They're based on concrete evidence. We have published several reports, and this is about genocidal policy. The second, which is very important, based on the same principle. The president of Azerbaijan constantly speaks in the language of threats about our country and the entire population. And he is proud to have a generation grown up with feelings of hatred and animosity. Even I have, we have published this. These words are documented. These are public uh, messages uh, of the president of Azerbaijan. 
The Azerbaijani authorities deliberately continue to cause mental suffering to the families of Armenian captives and missing persons and violate the rights of captives, captives, but not only publishing the real number of captives and prisoners of war that we have in Azerbaijan, but constantly denying, artificially den delaying the process of their return and release and denying uh, this process. Another very important thing is that the real danger of reoccurrence of Azerbaijani atrocities during the war against Armenian civilians and servicemen has not been eliminated, I think, while no one has been held responsible for what occurred. The Azerbaijani armed servicemen are present illegally in the sovereign territory of Armenia, and because of their presence, rights of constitutionally recognized and internationally recognized rights are, are, are violated. And, and the, the problem is that, again, this uh, very much uh, creates problems for the peace and security in the region. In the vicinity of villages of Gehar Konik and Sunik provinces, Azerbaijani armed servicemen continue to grossly violate rights of border residents of Armenia. Here, I mean, threatening Armenian citizens, as I said, by displaying their weapons to them. People are deprived of access to their lands, pastures, periodic, also periodic shootings near the borders of Armenia, we have to be to, to take into account. Then finally, gross violations of rights and provocations are recorded on the roads between communities, connecting communities of the Sunni province. You know, and uh, well, our compatriots, I think, I think they know what I'm talking about, speaking about. This is the presence of Azerbaijani armed personnel, military servicemen on the roads that are connecting our civilian communities. And we had already several cases or of, of provocation, not several, I mean, many of them, peri periodically uh, that are being registered, uh, throwing stones towards the Armenian car, then dragging and beating by military, Azerbaijani military servicemen, an Armenian shepherd in the village, next to village uh, Aravus of, of Teh community. Um, and it served their presence on the roads is, uh, is, is, is done, I think, to intimidate our people because it, because of this presence on the roads, people even refrain to travel uh, from this, um, to use this, to use this uh, roads. That is why I think this, uh, these all factors bring me to an idea that the security zone must be created. It means the removal, they should be removed, Azerbaijani armed forces, the flags and signs from those locations, from those places where they are now located. You know, one, I will, I will now try to explain also in another way, in a different way. There, there has been never delimitation or demarcation process between Armenia and Azerbaijan, right? As between, as processes between two so sovereign states. Since there has been no delimitation or demarcation, consequently, we have to build this concept or the, 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 uh, the, the kind of border determination processes based on human rights and putting a person, a human being in the center, because according to delimitation and demarcation mandatory principles, among them, we have also human rights protection and rule of law and democracy. So consequently, the criterion uh, or the, let's say, uh, indicator of delimitation demarcation process is very simple. Whether normal life of people was undermined, was destroyed or not. And we can see now that normal life of our people, of our border residents is totally destroyed. That is why before any delimitation or demarcation processes, we have to have the security zone at least 10 kilometers. There should be no Azerbaijanis and it should not be done. It cannot be done on, uh, on, at the expense, at the uh, expense of the of the or, or or the territory of Armenia, let's say, because we have uh, civilian communities there, and it should be done um, based on the on the principle that I have I, I have just uh, told to to give uh, to restore at least uh, at the minimum level the rights of our border residents, and because delimitation or demarcation it may take dozens of years. You know, if not longer. Uh, Anwar Jans, can, if I may, can I, I want to take you back a little bit, um, not in time, but in perspective, uh, because mm -hmm. I, I think that, and maybe follow me along this line and, uh, and, and let me know your thoughts. Uh, 
I think that there's a much bigger game going on uh, uh, in the in this particular instance. Um, we have spoken a number of times uh, regarding the speed with which uh, Azerbaijan uh, and Aliyev have been trying to push issues uh, post uh, the November 9th statement. Um, and we have spoken, in fact, the idea of the, um, of the uh, security zone in some ways slows that process, the speed by which this pro the, the process is being pushed by the Azerbaijanis. There has been a lot of discussion, as Gado had mentioned, about an agreement that may have been signed, may not have been signed, exists or may not exist, and discussions regarding those. Um, but one thing that is really clear is that Aliyev just a couple, uh, with 30, 36 hours ago, started uh, claiming that, that he's pushing that for a peace treaty, right? That Armenia and Azerbaijan need a peace treaty and that, uh, that uh, Azerbaijan is ready to recognize the territorial integrity of Armenia and Armenia, if Armenia would recognize the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. Um, I have a couple of issues with this, uh, and I guess I'm coming at from the perspective from, of an international lawyer here, and I want to get your thoughts on this. It is really possible that in the game of border delimitation, demarcation, in this game and in these agreements that may or may not be signed, we lose something even bigger in this game. Because if there is a recognition, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Armanjan, if there's a recognition by Armenia of the borders of Azerbaijan, that is in and of itself a recognition that Artsakh lies inside those borders. And therefore, it really speaks strongly to the narrative that Aliyev is trying to, uh, has been trying to argue from the beginning of, from the November 9th statement. I'm afraid that what we're walking into or actually running into uh, with respect to the border demarcation delimitation issue, if it's not slowed down the way that you propose through commissions, through the border security issue, I mean the uh, uh, the security zone issue, um, I think we I think we're walking into a much bigger problem, a much bigger problem, and I and I and I say this, you know, mindful of the fact that uh, that so much has been done, which quite frankly has shocked. Uh, many people, many observers, not only in Armenia, but outside Armenia, regarding Armenia's handling of its own sovereignty issues and its own territorial integrity issues. For example, uh, not having border positions protected um, uh, around uh, Black Lake, uh, not have the response to border incursions being, uh, if anything, timid is probably perhaps a, uh, a polite way to say it. But isn't there a bigger risk here, Arman, like that, that we're that by this process moving ahead so quickly, and and if there are agreements to be made on border delimitations, demarcation lines, that we could be walking into a much bigger problem of, and and I hate to say it, inadvertently agreeing or intentionally, I don't know, I'm 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 not I'm not a politician, to uh, to recognizing that Artsakh is on the Eastern side of that borderline, and therefore we recognize the borders of uh, of Azerbaijan, and now we have peace. But what we've lost is Artsakh completely. Is that not a risk of moving so quickly in this process? Garmik, uh, this is very important part, and um, this is one of the um, let's say most risky parts. And uh, when it comes to the protection of our compatriot rights who live in Artsakh. And of course, the limitation process ideally could mean what you have just told. But uh, since this issue has also some political components, that is why usually in my statements I have been refraining from um, giving some assessments to this to the political components. But when it comes to human rights protection, I have to say that in the when when we have this existence of this genocidal policy, a policy of ethnic cleansing, the spreading the state-sponsored hate speech, state-sponsored hatred and armenophobia, protection of our compatriots' rights, who live in Artsakh is of great importance. This is, this is very important. This is an issue of their existence. And of course, the purpose of Azerbaijani authorities 
as the, this war shows, and generally they, this is their general, let's say, policy, is to exterminate Armenians who live in Artsakh. And of course, generally all Armenians, but at least Armenians in this context, Armenians who live in Artsakh. That is why um, I cannot say here maybe too much given my mandate, but I can, uh, I can highlight one very important thing. We have never, we, we must never forget, and we can, uh, we cannot do this uh, to, to, to forget about the rights of our compatriots who live in Artsakh. This is, this is very important. Otherwise, if they are, if the, if, if they are locked up, let's say, in the territory of Azerbaijan, I think this will be, uh, it is very obvious that this will be the end of uh, Armenians. Uh, their free existence, their all but gross breaches of all um, rights of our compatriots, and very important, the right to life, right to dignity, security, and health, which is very important. And this is this is the most uh, risky part. That is why I agree with you. Yes, that the process is very speedy, and uh, the, also another problem is that um, the process has not involved specialists who could at least work on the ground, who could give their assessment based, based on the needs on the ground and on the real needs, and also taking account the tragic results of this war and the humanitarian disaster that Azerbaijani authorities during the war intentionally created in Artsakh, I think, by their bombings and by targeting civilian communities. That is why I um, um, I, I agree with you in terms of uh, when it comes to your assessments uh, on this matter, and of course I share these concerns as well. Uh, Arman, um, if if the CSTO is is saying we're monitoring the situation, and if uh, Russia, I think it was Russia's uh, uh, deputy foreign minister, uh, is saying that. Uh, we will um, uh, we will provide assistance to Armenia and Azerbaijan if both countries ask for it. Well, we know that Azerbaijan is not going to ask for it. Azerbaijan uh, started escalating and disregarding any norms immediately after uh, Mr. Lavrov paid a visit to Baku. Uh, now, I know your mandate is not a political mandate. But I want to come back. I want to come back. If, if you are the human rights defender of Armenia and your, uh, your mandate is uh, to be the eyes and ears to make sure that the citizens of Armenia's civil rights and human rights are protected, first and foremost, as it relates to the government that governs it, governs the people. But of course, then beyond that. Uh, but then on the political sphere where you do not cross, Shouldn't the government of Armenia be the guarantor of the civil and human rights of its citizens? And I'm specifically in this instance referring to uh, what's going on at the border, uh, what's going on in terms of discourse uh, with Moscow, what's going on in terms of talk about setting up commissions and and uh, of Azerbaijan and Armenia to try and figure out these, this latest six point document. Uh, but in all of this, you know, on the six months after the, uh, the offensive onto Artsakh and thousands of uh, casualties, uh, civilian mostly uh, unnecessary, there's no such thing as a necessary casualty, but civilian mostly casualties, infrastructure, cultural, uh, uh, cultural uh, monuments and whatnot. Are we really now six months later going to allow that dark chapter of our history just six months ago to be repeated in Sunik, Yagan Sunik, and, 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 and in all those villages that Many of us have traveled on our way to uh, Arsakh and we turn and make a sharp left. And on the right, there's the, there's this man-made little sandy hills and the village right next to uh, Barir Sevag's uh, home and all the other villages are supposed to be uh, coming under under uh, threat. And, and what is going on? Who, who holds the government accountable when it comes to human and civil rights violations 
of its citizens. I hate to put it that way, but it is the only way that I could describe it. Arjun, as you very rightly mentioned, uh, there is uh, too much uncertainty. Uh, so this was the context of your question, as I see. But let me first say that, of course, the, in, uh, I, I do not have any political mandate, so I cannot uh, give any uh, thoughts uh, on this matter. But what I can say that this is a fact. Many rights of our border residents, and not only border residents, by the way, of all our citizens even, they remain grossly violated. Many rights are in under real danger because of this so-called border, or, I don't know, determination, border process, or call whatever you want. But this is an illegal process, which resulted in violation, gross violation of the rights of all our citizens, entire population of Armenia. And of course, we can say here also, join here uh, Artsakh, our compatriots living who live in Artsakh, because there is also uh, there are also some problems. Another, and as you very rightly said, by the way, the purpose of Azerbaijan, what, uh, what comprises, what, what uh, do comprise their uh, genocidal policy? This is not only physical extermination of uh, people, uh, their torture, etc., but destruction of Armenian cultural heritage, religious heritage, which is also very important, and they do comprise these components of genocidal policy, and deeply rooted, by the way. Now, when it comes to the uh, here to Armenia, there is the problem is that there is a, a huge amount of uncertainty, ambiguity. People do not know what will happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow <coughs> or today. And you know, I think this is I why I'm uh, here. I have um, I think that the government should change its policy in terms of uh, providing proper information to the society to the public to be as predictable as it is possible. Because what is the problem? If the government stays passive, then eventually the government becomes the victim of its own passiveness. Why? What I mean here, I will try to explain in at least um, one, in, in, with one or two sentences. You know, as a, if the government is silent on many issues, since this issue is very, very uh, crucial and it interests every person who lives in Armenia, of course, other Armenians as well who live outside of this country, this vacuum is filled with too much uh, wrong information, fake news, you know, and it creates a later tension, eventually in the end, tension in the society because, and also it, resu it also results in increasing authority, so to say, of uh, unofficial sources of information, because people then try to get information from different sources. Also, I have to say that Azerbaijani authorities uh, play their role as well, they, because it is, it is in their interest to keep this society in tension. That is why it is very important that the government gives proper information to the society, to the public, takes the initiative, which is very important, takes the initiative, one from one information center. For example, what is the, and I, and I, I will bring just one example. Uh, um, if you go to the, in, if you analyze the information sphere of Armenia, you will see that many information is provided by local administrations, by heads of provinces, etc. But this is wrong because the government, it should, the information should be very central, should be, there should be central policy. For example, the Ministry of Defense, I don't know, or some government, the central authority should provide periodically proper information. Other than that, well, because of, uh, uh, because of absence of this kind of single policy, journalists or people have to refer to all officials that they know. And, that, and because of this, the information provision uh, to the public becomes very decentralized. And because of this, people get, um, let's say, non-credible information, which is at the, at the end, it is again one of the factors that contributes to the tension here. That is why, for example, as the villages you mentioned, again, there are so many rumors, there are so many uh, uncertainty, there is so many uncertainty in our society that uh, that is a component co contributing to tension. And uh, I agree with you with the context of your question that the government must provide, must take the initiative and provide always 
proper information periodically uh, about all these sensitive issues so that this nation, our people, the entire population knows what is happening because this issue concerns everyone. And I, and I think, Armand, to, to, to follow up on that point, I think we've seen a, in a really unfortunate trend repeatedly, particularly, I mean, now it's uh, since, the, since the, the, the last few weeks of the war up until this period, where the Ministry of Defense says something, uh, and then 24 hours later, uh, the opposite happens to be true. Uh, there's nothing going on. And of course, there is something going on. And, and then, like you said, it leaves this vacuum. And unfortunately, what happens, not only do people turn to unofficial sources, but sometimes they even turn to the, and I will use the word, the enemy sources, not the opponent's sources, but the enemy sources for information. So I, 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 your, your point on the value of providing accurate and truthful information on an ongoing basis is, uh, is really well taken because that vacuum is sometimes filled not only by, uh, by rumors, uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's sometimes filled by the enemy state. Um, and we've seen that on a number of occasions. You wanted to comment on that. Well, yes, I think that uh, the, I consider generally that here in this field, the, the, the government is failing its role, and this is a failed policy of providing proper information uh, to the public. Because of this, you know, there is another problematic, uh, let's say, um, I would say phenomenon. The government, does not provide proper information or certain authorities does not provide proper information to the society, then the public starts discuss, discussing issues based on referring to different other unofficial sources. And later, the, some officials, because of the failure of the government policy in the information area, start accusing citizens in conducting or in, in, in contributing to the tension in spreading the information, uh, in, in uh, bringing tense in our society. I have to say that the government is number one responsible actor here to prevent all of these uh, negative phenomena and to put the process under the control. And even then the government will be, uh, will, uh, again, will everything, will the government will secure the situation, the atmosphere here, at least will keep the, the the process under the control and of course in the um, in a reasonable sense which will better protect them uh, which will provide our people uh, with their rights which will guarantee their right to be informed about these processes which are very vital and they concern everyone you know if someone something wrong is happening right now for example in the bordering village or in two three bordering villages of Sunik or Gevar Kunik and the government is trying to hide this information, it will eventually be published somehow. Because and now means of connections are so developed that the information will come out again, anyway will come out. That is why it's better for the government to take the initiative and to control the process from the very outset. And I wanna follow up with that if I can, Garo, because I know you wanna get a question in, but I do wanna follow up on this because uh, two little bits of pieces of information cir circulated very recently, which I think uh, it really kind of, uh, hones in on another element of human rights, and that is, you know, the uh, the the right to to vote, essentially, and the right to participate in your government. Obviously, in a parliamentary system, you know, you're not electing a a president, right? You're electing a legislative body, a block, who then has a leader, and 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 the reason I bring that up is because. Um, in the, in the current system, every time that there's some issue to come up regarding discussions with the other side, discussions in Moscow, discussions at the border, um, everything, and I understand to the degree that it needs to be private from the public, I understand that. Um, there was a recent issue uh, from government, government sources, other ministries within the government, where they were complaining about not having information regarding the very issues that are within their, their ambit. Okay. And the reason I bring up the parliamentary versus presidential system is that the people have elected a government, um, not necessarily only an individual. And my question is, regardless of the, of the fact that issues need to be kept uh, out of the public sphere, are you confident that within the government, within the government and its various branches of experts and, uh, and, uh, and ministries, 
that information, and perhaps you either can or can't, and if you can't, I understand, but I want to ask the question regardless. Does the government itself, its own bureaucrats, its own technocrats, its own experts within the government know what is actually happening in these private or confidential discussions? Because it seems to be from the outside that when, when people from the ministries say, you know, speak out and say they don't know about this or they didn't know about this, that begs the question, perhaps they don't. And I, I want to ask you that question in terms of, you know, it's one thing for information not to be public, but is information being shared within the government in a way that protects the uh, essentially the right of individuals to to have their government speak for them as opposed to uh, individuals speak for them? Because, uh, you know, they've elected a, 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 a government in a parliamentary system. And, and I hate to kind of drag on to another point, but it's related. Um, recently, in fact, one of our guests, uh, pre our pre uh, previous guest, um, uh, politician, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Marukian, had mentioned, uh, I, and perhaps uh, it's because I'm a lawyer and I pay too much, too close attention to words. Um, he referred to the elections coming up in June, if there are elections in June, mm -hmm. he used the word if. Um, I don't know whether I'm looking too deeply into that, but I would say if somebody's a candidate in, in, like he is in the election, I think that he would be very careful in using the words if or when. I think the differences are, are, are monumental. So the two questions, if I can just really quickly sum up, is there enough inter, intra-governmental information being passed around so that the various institutions of the government can weigh in on all these private discussions, one. And number two, um, is there a risk that there will not be elections? Uh, I will start from the, from the uh, question related to the possibility of elections. Well, I cannot uh, predict, I don't know, uh, but I'm getting prepared for, a, for monitoring, for impartial monitoring of elections because uh, we have this mandate and political protection of uh, electoral rights, political rights is um, within my mandate. So we have created a working group here and this working group will be monitoring. Um, I had already a discussion with the chief of central electoral commission, I have to say, and uh, we agreed uh, on several things and uh, the details will be discussed later. Uh, between and of cooperation, I mean, between our two institutions. So now, when it comes to um, to the issue of information flow within the government, uh, honestly, I see this issue. I see this problem, but the main problem, the major problem, relates to the uh, communication of the government with to the ability or to the uh, to their capacities with the public. This is the most important thing. Here, I mean, not only general public by giving statements, etc., or by press releases, but also their communication with journalists. So for example, what here happens? When they receive journalistic queries, let's say, on many issues, usually government authorities, they do not answer immediately, but they keep, they delay the answer. Anyway, they, have, they know that they have to respond. But they delay the response, let's say, and they respond within one month, two months, or I don't know, 15 days. But it is already, the, the practice shows that uh, usually it is too late when they already provide the response because the vacuum has been already filled up with um, fake news. This is also very important. And that is why I think the most important thing for the government is to establish proper communication with the public at large, general public, and with journalists, which is very important because then journalists, of course, keep their contacts also, they, they provide the information to the public, and by this, um, keep us informed, informed generally the public about, uh, about the, the, um, the problems or uh, processes that are going around. So the, again, just to sum up, um, um, let me reiterate that, um, especially recently, what we could observe, this is nothing but failure uh, from of the uh, government authorities, their policies in terms of their communication, proper com communication with the public and uh, with uh, journalistic, uh, let's say with journalists. And this will, this creates another 
uh, this, this, is, this is a factor that contributes very largely to the tension and the government has to take the initiative, especially in these very, very sensitive areas and the questions that uh, concern delimitation or demarcation of our borders, the protection of rights of our border residents. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, <clears throat> when, when the government uh, resigned and uh, a special election date was set, June 20th, which incidentally is four weeks from now, four weeks in the United States, this being Sunday night. So it's, it's really three Sundays later or four Sundays later, Max, I, I suppose. It's 28 days. Uh, because of the situation and because of what uh, Carnig alluded to earlier that at least one uh, political party chairman made, made the remark uh, during their uh, party uh, congress, if you will, the, do the people of the Republic of Armenia have a right to have duly elected representatives, not those who were duly elected, who resigned and are just uh, gatekeepers or, or holding the place warm either for themselves again, if the people vote for them or for others or some combination of one or the other. Uh, is, there, uh, is there anything that you are aware of that mandates when a government resigns that by a date certain there needs to be special election to, uh, to put people in place who are elected anew? If you know, I don't know if there is such a thing. Uh, I don't have this, uh, let's say, well, I, I have some some information, but I think if I publicly express it, uh, it may sign also some political nature. Um, but uh, generally, I understand you. And uh, uh, we have many people who ask similar, similar questions. And this because why, why resign if, you, if you're going to then in, you know, continue to defer a new elections, you might as well stay in place. If that yeah, exactly, case, right? exactly, exactly. We have what you know. The, the important we have to have a very important criteria: human rights and democracy should be at the core of all processes, and uh, democratic processes uh, should be the basis for the development of our country, especially in this very difficult situation. And if we abrupt them, if we have, if we create uh, problems in the um, continuous process of this democratic, uh, let's say, elections or whatsoever, then we may uh, experience more problems, let's say, in the future. That is why I think this should be as reference point to have always uh, all the processes within democratic, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. development. And uh, the, because this is at least in the difficult situation of our country, this is the only guarantee uh, to save the process and to put human rights in the center um, for the key to solve the problems that our country faces now. And, and Anvantan, I think that you've done a tremendous job uh, and a very unique job, I have to say, among uh, human rights ombudsmen uh, throughout the world, obviously, particularly through Europe. But uh, in that national security as a human right. I mean, we are literally dealing with that issue, which I, I doubt very highly uh, very many uh, human rights ombudsmen deal, deal with uh, on a regular basis. And you've highlighted this point uh, during the war, immediately after the war, and it's no surprise to me. I don't know if you would care to comment on that, but from what I, uh, our sources indicate, you're, because of the openness that you've shown with, with the people and actually having these missions directly to the hotspots where these issues are, are most pressing, you know, your offices and your approval ratings seem to go becoming, you know, are skyrocketing. In the last report that I saw yet again, there were increases in your office's uh, approval ratings, uh, which is not the case, uh, generally speaking, with, uh, throughout the, the Republic of Armenia and other institutions um, at all. Um, in fact, the trend seems to be going the other way in all other institutions. My question uh, is, is this, having said that. Um, 
you you were the first really to highlight as a human right the national security crisis on individual human beings. This is a very interesting um, uh, approach because it hasn't really been it hasn't really been done because the upper, the issue had never been there really in in this particular instance. Um, and as, if you can speak. Uh, and every day that we, you know, we hear the news, uh, we, uh, we hear the reports, uh, we see foreign powers weighing in, um, the discussion regarding uncertainty of information, if we backtrack six months, this is the same type of discussion we were having regarding nine months regarding Artsakh, right? Um, the idea of uncertainty of information, what's happening, what's not happening, border issues, individual security issues, um, and it seems to be, to me, that, I mean, it's a very surreal um, reality. Uh, I guess that might be an oxymoron there, but the point is that it's a very surreal instance right now where we're having this conversation with foreign uh, enemy troops on our territory. We're having this conversation. Uh, very few states would be in the mood to be having any conversations in that particular instance. Uh, but that is exactly what we're doing, having conversations and negotiations. Um, and I understand the path to peace is, is an important one. Um, however, I don't think that the path of war is yet finished. That said, what are the pressing uh, human national security related human rights issues that you see? I know it's a short amount of time we have left that we should be looking at, we should be weighing in on as, uh, as diaspora and Armenians, as Armenians in Armenia and Armenians in Artsakh, what should we be focused on in the next, literally in the next few days, in the next week or so, what are the pressing issues that are concerning you the most? John, the most, uh, I would say the concerning issue, uh, is the issue of the security and peace in our country, right to life, the issue of existence of our people, not only, by the way, Armenia, but also, of course, rights, protection of rights of our compatriots in Artsakh. You see, you refer to the uncertainty of information. Many people ask a question now, are we going to lose Artsakh? What will happen? The rights, because if the delimitation or demarcation process is in a way uh, that is supposed to be classically, it means that uh, there will be already no sense of speaking of the rights of our compatriots who live in Artsakh, right to self-determination, for example, right to life, etc. But we have another very pressing issue. This is, these are very vital rights, very vital rights I, have, I want to highlight, related to the right to life, right to physical security, integrity of our people, not only physical integrity, but psychological integrity, because because mm -hmm. of this border delimited so-called determination or border processes, immediately after the war, the whole life of our people, psychological integrity has been totally destroyed. And we always live in stress. We don't know what will happen tomorrow, and which is very important. And this is very um, a matter of huge concern for me as the human rights defender of this country, because this process generally affects human rights protection in the area. Because of this process, because of the situation that exists now, the political situation in the country is very tense. Because of this, human rights, normal human rights, are under, um, are kind of forgotten. You even sometimes I feel that every human right is just abandoned. We do not remember about right to social security. We do not remember <laughs> about rights of children who live in child rights institution, about rights of persons with disabilities, that they live in, they face discrimination and stigma. We don't speak that much already about rights of people who live, who, who spend uh, their time in, uh, because they are sentenced to, uh, to, to, to certain amounts of years, and they are in prisons, etc. So you see, this process generally uh, pushed us back, I think, and now all other vital very human, uh, vital human rights. They are um, under the shadow, let's say, of these uh, security issues. That is why, and it is on one hand, it is understandable, but on the other hand, it generally um, is degrading the country. And and so that is why, for for me, I think the most important thing, of course, is this 
currently the security, human rights issues related to the security. The concept that human rights do complement security and democracy and all the way and, and all the way around. But here, having in the center the government that is providing proper information to the public, because this is also a respect of the government that they uh, must show towards the public uh, in, in issues related to this uh, security problems. And as the human rights defender, of course, I will continue my activities. We are now summarizing um, um, the concepts related to the creation of of the security zone. Uh, well, you know, I'm not a romantic, of course, and I, in this, uh, when it comes to these issues, and I, I'm the, too naive, I, and I understand that uh, the security zone maybe will not be created tomorrow, but at least we have to show the legal grounds, you know, the evidence that create the absolute need for this security zone. That is why even I publicly referred, I called upon uh, our powerful diaspora to help the human rights defender, to assist the human rights defender in terms of bringing up these problems, these facts, human rights gross violations and breaches to the attention of the world. That the, uh, because the, uh, the purpose of Azerbaijan now is to show to the world that everything is perfect. They are located on their territories. Their life is normal as if we are living in, uh, we live in heaven and uh, there is no need. Uh, for any concern, but we have to show to the world, to the outside world, that the situation is totally different here, and we experience gross violations and human rights breaches, and several months ago even we had the severe war crimes, which are, by the way, the danger, as I even stated publicly, is not uh, eliminated. So this is, uh, this is it, and uh, we will continue, of course, to work towards the, the, to this direction, and thank you for these very important questions. Uh, I think uh, the topic is very specific to, uh, and we have to bring it to open it uh, for details to the to, to our public to to our compatriots. Thank you very much uh, uh, Mr. Tatoyan. Uh, it is really an honor to have you back with us frequently like this to give us the the details from the ground from your uh, from the missions that you are running directly to the hotspots. Uh, as and I know that there are other grounds that we will still need to cover, and I know that your time is limited. Um, but uh, I did want to say, if I can have you comment just uh, 60 seconds, if you don't mind, on the current state of issues regarding the POWs, if you don't mind. Well, yes, the, the, the issue is, remains the same. They are Azerbaijani authorities uh, artificially delay the process. Um, they present everyone as uh, terrorists and uh, by this, uh, they very openly abuse all legal proceedings. Um, they connect uh, everything uh, with the with November 9th statement. And, uh, but then later, of course, because of these manipulations, they get, they get even lost uh, in all the reasonings. Now they say that everyone is, uh, is a terrorist. Unfortunately, they do not release the real number of prisoners of war and civilian captives that they have. Uh, and uh, they also manipulate with the situation. You know, the, the thing is that um, I consider that we have still an armed conflict. The armed conflict is not, is not closed. Yes, there are no hostilities, uh, which is true. Uh, but the armed conflict itself, there is no peace agreement. So it means that under the international humanitarian law, these people, whoever is under their control, is considered a prisoner of war or a captive by status. So consequently, they are under the protection of international humanitarian law, and they should be returned uh, to Armenia. Of course, the Azerbaijani authorities are politicizing the problem, uh, and they also ignore international assessments, international statements. Uh, recently, European Parliament has made a statement, then the, uh, some other agencies, but by this, by not returning Armenian prisoners of war, they, uh, of course, they cause mental suffering to our people, to the families of uh, prisoners of war, and to also missing people. But by this, they are also deepening the animosity and uh, armenophobia. And I, can't, I cannot imagine how they speak about peace when they do not return 
release and return Armenian prisoners of war. This is what are also bringing to the attention of international community. Recently, uh, there was an initiative from international community already to start the peace building process. You know, but my, and they chose also the human rights institution as one of the main interlocutors, but, but my response is very simple here. There should be certain preconditions to start this building process. When you have prisoners of war illegally being held in Azerbaijan, all the animosity, et cetera, how they can speak, we can speak about um, uh, peace. That is why I'm saying that the peace is the highest value for us, but uh, we have to be very careful in terms of fake, uh, because we, we have been always facing fake peace building from the uh, Azerbaijani authorities. Uh, this is it, and they are politicizing the issue, of course, apparently of prisoners of war. And uh, but we have to continue working, of course, because every minute, uh, every second, is very important that our compatriots spend. Uh, we have to protect their rights and to save them, let's say, from the captivity, uh, because all of us we can imagine their uh, situation in Azerbaijan, and um, also uh, very importantly. Uh, the situation of, and the health status and the psychological uh, status of their families uh, here in Armenia. Ranjan, thank you so much for always putting principle uh, in your practice because it has made all the difference in giving perspective, proper perspective to the issues that we're seeing today and, and making sense of that. And with that, I want to pass it over to Gado to make his closing remarks because I know, Arman, you have a, a meeting that you are now a few minutes late for as it is. Uh, I, I want to thank you, Arman, uh, on behalf of countless, countless Armenians globally and, of course, in the homeland uh, for your continuing, relentless and uh, unsparing efforts. Uh, we did not get around to talking about your trip to Moscow. Uh, we did not get around to talking about your upcoming trips, of which Carnegie and I are aware in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, and your ongoing efforts on all fronts. I wanted to say in closing, I wanted to quote you actually, which you actually um, referred to. You wrote, peace is the highest value for us, but we must not allow Azerbaijani authorities to muddle us with fake peace process. Uh, and, in, and in understanding what you meant by that, it was obvious to me the following, that the POW issue, which I'm glad Karnik brought up because if he hadn't, I was going to say, look, we spent an hour speaking uh, about, about what's going on in the border regions, uh, delimitation and demarcation, and the rights of the people uh, to have a peaceful life in their own homes and villages. And we did not talk about POWs because that's exactly what is being intentionally done. While we have countless prisoners of war and civilian captives sitting there, we now are on the verge of suffering additional such captives. When we watch videos, videotapes of people pushing Armenian servicemen, people threatening Armenian shepherds, people uh, infringing about the, about the Armenian villagers' rights and the children in those villages, uh, the skies are not bright today, and and I'm and I am ashamed that while people are talking about uh, who is best to run this country, I sure hope that these elections take place and are not postponed, because the way things are going, we will not have a country to run. So when we people are talking about who should be sitting on the chair of whatever ministry, who should be running the government, let's be mindful of the fact that the enemy is not at the gates. The enemy is inside the gates. It's in our territory. And it's been there. May 13. It was May 13 when the acting prime minister said that he described the situation as near critical and calling the Azerbaijan's actions intolerable. Intolerable means intolerable. Near critical is near critical. But it's 10 days later. 10 days later, and we still don't have answers. We still have foreign troops on Armenian sovereign lands. This is outrageous. The, the two words that come to mind are defiance and exploit, exploitation. 
defiance by Azerbaijan of a peace treaty or, or a ceasefire rather, rather entered into on November 9th, six and a half months ago, practically. Defiance, total defiance, disregard, not coming to a meeting, not paying attention to what's going on, talking the talk and, and saying whatever it wants to say, changing churches in Artsakh, calling them Albanian, destroying and uh, uh, causing an evaporation of a church and, and, and gets away with it. You name it, it's happening. You name it, it's happening. And the exploitation, I am sad to say, and I'm not anti-Russia or pro-America, I'm none of those things, okay? Russia is an important ally. You'd have to be an idiot not to understand Russia's importance to Armenia. But there's an exploitation going on here. Whatever happened to, hey, if you come into Armenian territory, Russia will come to your defense. What happened to that? Were the, were the borders not defined when that agreement was entered into? Clearly they were defined. How could this happen? And what is going on in our, in our parliament, in our ministries, that they would allow this to happen? And forgive me, where is my opposition? Exactly where are these opposition parties and what are they doing to force the issue today? I'm not hearing anybody saying this is what has to happen. Why are the people not on the, on the streets today? They were on the streets after the war. Well, you know what? The enemy just swallowed up a piece of Armenian heritage and homeland, most of Artsakh, and is about to swallow up Armenia proper, important parts of Armenia proper. Uh, these are not fun times. And 28 days from now, I really hope that in the next 28 days, the priority is to secure the border, to secure the safety of the citizens, and at the same time, march forward, have elections, form a government, whether it's a unified government or a majority government, I don't care. Form a government and enter into some concrete agreements with some concrete steps and tangible results. We will be here to support in every which way we can from the diaspora far and near. Thank you, Arman. I'll be talking to you. Karnik, sorry. I vented too long. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, two words. Yes. Uh, I will, of course, um, I understand your concerns and, um, and, and I very much appreciate uh, these discussions because they are also a very important platform uh, to provide information, proper information uh, to our compatriots, uh, to the diaspora, to our people, so that they are aware. And this is also for awareness raising purposes. These discussions are very important. And as the, I have to also to, as, as um, at the end of, of this discussion, I have to highlight that uh, we will continue, of course, and we do continue serving in an apolitical uh, within our apolitical mandate, non-political mandate, being always neutral, uh, which keeps us strong, uh, which keeps us um, more credible in our steps, and of course, uh, to keep strong relations with our international partners, to bring to their attention all the gross violations, and not to allow Azerbaijan to spread the fake news to the international community and to rewrite the history of our people at the expense of the rights of our people, which is, I think, very important for us uh, for the moment, one of the important tasks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hold firm. Thank you.